I was going to open by who has had the misfortune of having someone in their life or having someone have a medical issue. But obviously, through all these stories, like, it's kind of benign. So who hasn't had one? Okay. <laughs> well, um, I'm here to share my experience uh, with... I'm a cancer survivor, a liver transplant, and bone marrow transplant recipient. And uh, so, from the hospital room to graduate school, I'm here to share my story. Um, so, it kind of began when I was on summer vacation uh, with Idaho, Hawaii, back to back. But um, I came back and I had persistent itching, and I totally thought it was just, uh, what did I do or something? So, this started like just as persistent, like I could not sleep, like it was really, really bad. And um, then during the semester starting, I, uh, it, I eventually turned yellow, and I was, I was like 17. And, um, you yeah, know, like people were kind of weird. Like, um, and ever since then, I really, that started the kickoff of like the never ending cycle of doctor's visits that everyone's probably aware of. <laughs> but uh, I was diagnosed with primary sclerosis polyomyelitis, called PSC, the liver disease of the bile ducts that just. It's like a stricture. Um, so to help mitigate the negative effects of the jaundice, they put like straws in my like bile ducts, and that was like every two months they really went in. They uh, under general anesthesia that they went under. I went under and um, had to go through that. And keep in mind, I'm in high school. Like I was, I actually. Uh, had 90 days out of the 180 days of my senior year. And then um, then I got a call from Phoenix Children's Hospital, because that's where I was at the whole time. Uh, they asked me to rush down to the hospital because they have a liver for me. Um, so the surgery went perfect, um, except that they found cancerous lymph nodes, and that my my liver was actually cancerous entirely. Um, so that the next step was lymphoma treatment and uh, chemo, much worse than transplant, I have to say. <laughs> so during this time, I had no direction. I was like just graduated from high school, and I was had to do something. So I went to SEC for community college. And then I transferred to ASU, and after five changes to my major, I <laughs> I decided to enroll as a mathematics student, which was why. But it was it was, <laughs> it was because of my dad, his influence on philosophy. My life was significant, so I tried it. It stuck. And uh, anyways, the. Um, so I decided to get educated while I was in the hospital. And also, like, I could do that while I was in the hospital and not in school. Like, all my classes were kind of the best. Um, <laughs> so the, but the challenges were far from over at that point. I went to SSC, and then, you know, I got back into ASU. I was in person for the first time since COVID, which is like a year and a half. Um, but then I went to a, a, an immunology appointment where it was just a routine follow-up, and they di sat me down and diagnosed me with common variable immune deficiency. So CVID is the underlying cause of all of my problems beforehand, um, and that kind of that struck me as like, no, it's not real. Like there's no way, <laughs> um, and. They told me I needed a bone marrow transplant, but here I am with my really long hair. So I'm, I'm gonna keep my hair for as long as I can. <laughs> in my view, that was like the, the one like piece of control that I had in my life. So I I, I was beginning to feel like I had no control. Um, and making friends was 
excruciatingly difficult that is you being a commuter student and not being on campus like a semester at a time and like just being gone all the time. Um, so I never realized that normalcy would like never return in the same way. Um, and me being in high school, I was like, definitely that was a shock. But the eight month uh, isolation that was required, ish, eight month ish, that was required after the bone marrow transplant was my time to create my own future. Um, so I studied math uh, while I was in, in chemo um, and I was recovering and I, I I remember one professor studied, I studied with, he said he made accommodations for his whole class to make me in the class. So um, it was an advanced capitalist class, which is like, but um, I also played around with Python just to keep myself engaged. And the reason I say this is because it like fundamentally drove up the motivation for my career. Um, especially being in the hospital, I realized that um, I can use this towards people like me, towards decisions that can be made that help better patients' lives. And uh, so, I do have to say, the nurse's reaction is great every time. What are you studying? <laughs> Math? What? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I also began reading philosophy at this time. And um, Emerson and Thoreau, I have to mention because they're my favorite authors of all time. And I felt like I was in my own little Walden pond. <laughs> so, um, so, but behind the scenes, I was definitely a changing person through all of this. Um, and all of this stuff, especially starting in high school, it fundamentally changed like who I was and really good friends and do drink at all. Um, so one time during the hospital, I fainted. I was going to the bathroom. I just dropped and I hit my head and it was a pretty shocking, like pivotal moment in my life because I got back in bed, so I don't know how long after, um, and I asked myself like questions that motivated like what, what, what am I, how long am I going to live? And like, will I ever be as free as I once was beforehand? And this was, I was just a high school student. All I had was the, the, um, sense in my liver. And, uh, I got a tattoo when I was eventually out of the hospital that was memento mori. It's on my collarbone. It was just a, a reminder to myself that life is so fragile. And uh, so, again, that's kind of a lot philosophical. And uh, so I looked everywhere to like actually engage with tamping down my feelings of anxiety and like the uncertainty of it all. And so I turned to Buddhism and Stoicism, um, more so Buddhism, so it's under flag right now. Um, and also Emerson and Thoreau. So not from a religious angle, but more of like a how to best live your life. So I practiced as best as I could for as long as I could. And regular meditation, reading, contemplation, reflection, journaling, all that. And I eventually realized that through two years of trying to have just the best day you possibly could, that was that's what changed me. And so it was the like accumulation. It's not just one day, it's like the accumulation of all of it. That's what changed me. And um, so eventually the the negative intrusive thoughts of like what is, what are you gonna do, like that kind of thing. They eventually subsided and I had this like I created this buffer of like stimuli and response, which I think is really interesting with meditation. Um, but yeah, I think the, the two year period where I was trying to have the best day possible and I was reading as much as I could and I just 
it, it, I feel like I've learned more about myself than an entire lifetime could. Um, so, from high school, I grew up so fast, and I became an entirely different person in one way. And I couldn't do it without my mom in the third, fourth row, third row, <laughs> over there, and my family, who's also been by my side the whole time. So, as I go to a career in biostatistics with my bachelor's in statistics, um, I want to eventually help patients like me. I want to help patients like you. Uh, I'm, I think that your stories are fantastic, and I really, really am astounded by the resilience. So, I had a story of survival, but it was more so a story of growth and, and growing through that change. So, yeah, that's it.